that when when we were doing it's oh it's currently <laughs> recording yeah when i was uh part of the big uh, fiber to the home project um you know back in well, 1997 98 99 um yeah there were um there were a lot of the bell labs uh development people that were on the fiber uh, fiber to the home uh, standards and mm -hmm. it's amazing to me that now here we still don't have fiber in our home here but you know so uh, there's still a lot of places that still do not have fiber in the home yet. Amazing, right? Yeah, that's how far ahead was looking more than 20 years. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm. Yeah, I worked on those passive optical chips for that. Darius, look who's there, Darius. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. you remember? Yeah. There's an old Bell Labs guy there. <laughs> Back in the early 90s. Darius, yeah. what, were you there in, in 2000 when uh, Sean wrote? No, I was there when we were making the, you know, a one by eight, one by four passive optical chipsets that would go into the fibers of the home panel so that you could split the signals to go to multiple homes. Yeah. You know, from, and those only just got deployed, what, you know, seven years ago, maybe. <laughs> that's amazing. That's, those, yeah. those investors have to be really patient, Darius. All right. <laughs> that's a thing they don't want to be, right? <laughs> right, right. Amazing. You're probably wondering, Wayne, how I have how I have time to sit through this colloquium, huh? <laughs> that's a great that's a great question. It must be you must be in a different time zone. Or where where are you at? Are you in LA? No, I'm in LA. Yes, but but I'm I'm curious because we're looking at 5G research now, and so I the, I saw the topic. I was like, this is this is this is very relevant to sure a lot of things going on. So I'm I'm very excited to listen. Yeah. So Sean, how, how much of this? Um, 5G problem are you going to talk about today? You're going to talk about the uh, the the kind of like the cell phone tower connection problem, or are you going to talk about backbones? Uh, how how much of this problem are you going to talk about today? Oh, so I think uh, maybe the whole optical network that is needed okay. to be enhanced to support Good. 5G. Well, yeah. that's, all that should cover it then. That's yeah. excellent. Yeah. And so also, I would reserve some time for Q and A. So in case there are some topics that people would like to discuss more. I'll be happy sure. to answer any questions. Sure. So I see Kai is setting up. Kai Davis is setting up in one on one, uh, Govan, right? Yeah, I think so. I think I think she's ready. I think if you want to start introducing him, it should be okay. I yeah, think. Yeah. Well, you're you're the boss, Govan. You tell me. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you should go ahead. I can go. We have about forty people, thirty five people. I see here on the thirty four. Okay. So you can go ahead and introduce okay, some more. Great. Come while you're introducing. I think that's fine. Okay, great. So very good. Okay, so thanks everybody for coming today on this Zoom totally virtual um, talk today. And um, I'm really happy to introduce Shang Lu. Um, uh, Shang Lu is is uh, is is a uh, is an, a quite an amazing uh, young, young man who I re remember very well. Um, and there's a very a, a many important lessons uh, for all students at the Institute of Optics here. Um, for anybody who is planning on graduating and looking for a job, um, I just so I want to tell you that here's how you do it. Okay, here's how you do it. So, so I went to uh, to a meeting and I was giving an invited talk. This was Sean. Was it probably 2000 or or 1999 or something like that? Uh, yeah, 1990. Yeah, yeah, like the most exciting time in telecom, um, except for now, right? But um, telecom was just exploding. It was so exciting, and so I was giving this talk about ultra fast technology. Um, in telecommunications, it was a very broad, visionary kind of uh, thing. Um, and there was this young man standing directly in the back of the room during my whole talk. He was just standing there. He didn't never, never even sat down. He was just standing. And um, and when I finished my talk, the questions were all over. And he walked right to the front of the room and he handed me his resume and he said, mm -hmm. "I want to work for you." Okay, that's what he said. So you know, I opened up his resume. I said, "Oh." God, this looks like a, looks like a really good guy here. So I said, well, I'll get back to you. And so, so yes, I did get back to him right away and I hired him and uh, into Bell Labs in my department. Um, he, he became a star. In fact, I think it's probably safe to say a superstar um, in Bell Labs and all kinds of, of high capacity telecom and really innovative stuff. Um, as you read his, um, his, his little bio, I'm not gonna read from that, but uh, he, he's been a very prolific researcher, publisher, um, and, and patenting, um, and so happy to uh, to say hi, Shang Lu. It's so great to see you again. Uh, please go ahead and give your talk. 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, all the professors and students, for this opportunity. Uh, let me try to share uh, my screen. Uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah, so this talk is about the optical innovations for communications and actually beyond in the era of 5G. Many of you know about 5G. And today I would like to also introduce this new term F5G, which stands for fixed networks 5G. Yeah, and one of the adjunct professor of uh, Hong Kong Polytech University, so I will be speaking as a, a fellow professor to just to cover all the interesting things happening in our field. And I would like to thank many colleagues in our industry for valuable collaboration and cooperation. So uh, as you know, we are in the so-called 5G era, uh, starting, uh, starting from 2020 uh, all the way to 2029. Then 6G will come along uh, in, you know, at, in the year 2030. So basically in the mobile network uh, domain, every 10 years uh, uh, occupy one generation. And in this era, we have uh, uh, enhanced broadband for basically high bandwidth delivery and, all, and also reliable low latency communication to give, uh, uh, to solve some missing critical, uh, you know, uh, issues. And then we have this massive machine type communication uh, to really support internet of things and smart city, smart home, uh, and, and this kind of uh, valuable applications. Yeah, then, uh, in our fixed network, we are also calling this decade, the decade of uh, uh, 5G, you know, the fixed generation of fixed networks. So by working together with the 5G, we are building this new digital world to support, you know, all the industries oh, and, uh, and also oh, enterprises oh, as well. Uh, sorry. Uh, Somehow, yeah, Arjun, connecting that, another... I would have to get from you, Arjun. Oh, okay. Maybe in the meantime, let me see if I can save bandwidth by, by turning off my okay. video. <laughs> yeah. Okay, then let's continue. Good. Yeah, so then uh, in terms of the vision of our 5G, we, uh, we want to have a fiber to everywhere and everything. Uh, you know, when Professor Marx hired me in year 2000, we were doing fiber to the home uh, with 1,000 women's channels uh, at that time, trying to uh, really provide broadband services. Now we are in this uh, uh, era of going beyond rooms, uh, homes, to fiber to the rooms and to the office desks, uh, desks and also machines so that we can enable uh, even better capacity and a higher energy efficiency. Yeah. Uh, then uh, in this uh, European Technic uh, Telecommunication Standardization Institute, we have this I5G uh, study group. And in this group, we have already identified 14 use cases, uh, similar to 5G, you know, this well-known triangle uh, to aim for enhanced fixed broadband, basically higher speed, uh, then guarantee the reliable experience to give people better quality of uh, internet services. And then full fiber connection to try to penetrate the fiber deeper to end the users to provide this uh, unprecedented bandwidth with uh, low latency and a low power consumption. Yeah, uh, to serve many uh, applications such as you know, public services, for smart cities as well as uh, industrial uh, applications. So uh, in today's talk, I will try to cover as much uh, ground as possible. Uh, in the end, uh, if any of you have a question regarding some particular topic, uh, I'll be happy to answer during the Q&A. So basically, uh, if anything you want to get, uh, you, uh, you know, I hope everybody will get out of today's talk is that this Decade, a decade is not only the 5G era decade, but also I5G. Uh, and uh, the fixed network is actually not only supporting all the wonderful things by the, uh, done by the uh, 5G networks, but also to complement 5G to directly deliver valuable services 
to businesses and homes. Yeah. So uh, if we use a typical example of a, a 5G network, in terms of the demand, traffic demand, uh, uh, we need 600 terabits per second of capacity for the front hall segment. So by the way, for people who are familiar with 5G, there's a new arch architectural change, uh, which is the so-called cloud run, a cloud uh, radio access network, where a lot of uh, processing for those wireless antennas will be done in data centers uh, nearby. Some of the data centers will be close closer to the antenna. We call that the dispute units. And then we have a centralized units, which may be far away to provide to perform more centralized functions. And then we have backhaul to bigger data centers to get the content. So the reason for this kind of partition uh, is to have a very low latency uh, processing in dispute units, which are typically 10 kilometers, less than 10 kilometers away from the wireless, wireless towers. Uh, so you can perform a coordinated multi-point and, and some other advanced uh, processing. Then for some uh, less timing critical processing, you, would do, you can do that in distributed units, which may be 40 kilometers away. Then for some uh, backhauling processing, uh, which are not timing critical, you can do that in a bigger data center, you know, every couple hundred kilometers away. Yeah, so basically if you consider this as a big city, you can have a couple of big data centers which are interconnected to provide all the content delivery, storage and computing functions. And then you have a, a central offices uh, to perform edge computing to support all the uh, wonderful things that need to be done for wireless networks. Yeah. So as you can see, uh, when people talk about 5G, they talk about the antenna and they may talk about the front hall section, but uh, in fact, there are a lot of fibers involved in order to support end-to-end uh, -end communication, you know, between a user using this tower and goes through the city to another city, and then uh, even through backbone network or even international network uh, back to another city and back to the tower and to another user. Yeah. So 99% of the, uh, the transmission distance or even more will be covered by fiber. So, uh, you know, for Institute of Optics in Rochester, you know, basically optics is very important, is playing a very important role in the 5G rollout. Yeah. Then in addition to that, we are directly supporting a fiber to the home and to the enterprises. Yeah. As you can see, uh, different segments have a different capacity requirement. And then in addition to high bandwidth, we need to have a low latency, accurate synchronization, and the ability to do network slicing so that you can get the assured uh, experience, uh, basically uh, communication experience with a minimized resource. Yeah. And so now uh, we will zoom into each section and, and have a more detailed description. Yeah. The first half will be the from hall part. For the from hall, as we mentioned, before people try to use this so-called CPRI, Common Public Radio Interface, to simplify the remote antenna uh, by doing all the processing in the, in the nearby, uh, you know, baseband processing unit. But, but by doing so, we have to digitize all the analog waveform and, and uh, transmit that uh, using digital formats. And this turns out to be very bandwidth inefficient. For example, for a typical case of a 5G using 100 megahertz of RF bandwidth and 64 by 64 MIMO transceiver, uh, the front hall data rate requirement will be over 300 gigabit per second. That's a lot of um, uh, cost associated with that. So basically, when the 5G engineers, you know, in the mobile domain, uh, designed their network, they overestimated, overestimated uh, the the ability of our optical network engineers. Uh, so then quickly they realize they cannot do that. So they will try to make this CPRI more efficient by doing some low level physical layer processing there. Yeah. So with that, uh, for a typical 64 by 64 MIMO 
25 gigabit per second of data rate would be is uh, good. And that's why there are a lot of uh, optics uh, targeting 25 gigabit per second for uh, those wireless antennas. Yeah. In the typical case of a 5G active antenna unit, you have uh, three sections, each covering 120 degrees. And each section you need a uh, uh, you know, bi-directional transmission. And also sometimes in addition to 5G, you need to cover 4G. So uh, uh, a, a common deployment scenario would require 12 fibers, uh, each uh, providing 25 gig per second of uh, EC free connection. So as you can see for 5G deployments, they need a lot of fibers. Uh, this may not be cost effective. So, uh, with the further advancement in 5G deployment, people realize that we have to rely on wavelength division multiplexing. Uh, in this case, uh, there are two solutions. One is based on main WDM, diverging data center optics is wavelengths, or this uh, media uh, WDM leveraging coarse WDM wavelength channels. So by doing so, you could have a one fiber delivering 12 channels for bidirectional transmission to serve such a 5G antenna. Yeah. Uh, by the way, currently, uh, there are already over 2 million 5G stations deployed worldwide. In China, uh, there are already over 1 million uh, uh, 5G based stations deployed by China Mobile alone. Yeah. So then for this LWDM, uh, this is a, in my talk given by a chief engineer from China Telecom. Uh, using this uh, uh, name WDM women's channels, but expand that to uh, 12 channels. And uh, in ITOT, you know, inter International Telecommunication Unit, uh, there is a, a work item trying to standardize uh, this interface, uh, which is called GDA OWDM, basically O band WDM. And uh, I'm actually the editor for this uh, standard. Then uh, for, uh, there's another talk in ACP uh, uh, plenary session uh, two years ago by Dr. Hani, who is the chief engineer of China Mobile. Uh, they were uh, focusing on this uh, MWDM, leveraging uh, course WDM women's channels, still 12 channels, but with wider channel spacing. And uh, uh, in ITU, there is another working uh, work item to, uh, to specify the interface for MWDM. Uh, I'm also serving as the editor for this uh, uh, standard. Then uh, going forward, uh, going to 6G uh, era, there may be more bandwidth needed. In that case, dense WDM will be utilized. And there are already uh, standardization work going on to try to uh, specify, uh, in this case, a 40 channel uh, system. Uh, the, but for 5G deployment, we want to have the remote unit to be as cost effective uh, as possible and as energy efficient as possible. So now for this kind of a 25G bidirectional, by the you know, uh, small form factor pluggable, it's really small uh, compared to a US quarter. This is quite remarkable. Yeah, because uh, uh, just a small pluggable can deliver uh, 25G in each direction. Yeah, so this is the one um, takeaway. And, and also, as you, as you can see, the uh, women's division multiplexing is now utilized to support the 5G uh, deployment. Then in academia, there were a lot of work before on radio over fiber to carry advanced uh, uh, antenna signals. Uh, but the radio fiber has some drawbacks uh, because of the limited uh, dynamic range or signal noise ratio. Uh, so uh, so uh, more recently, you know, like uh, uh, over uh, one and a half a year ago, uh, I published a paper in OFC to introduce this hybrid digital analog radio fiber, where we uh, use uh, both digital modulation and analog transmission to more uh, effectively uh, carry the antenna signal. So 
due to the time limitation, we will not go through the details. If you are interested, you can always find out this paper. But the key thing uh, is to uh, make an approximation of the antenna signal, the analog signal, and transmit those uh, quantized approximation uh, constellation with a high fidelity, meaning error-free transmission through digital uh, modulation and uh, coding. Uh, then the approximation error, you can transmit as is, you know, as the analog part, so that you can uh, obtain both a high reliability and the signal noise ratio and the high bandwidth efficiency. So showing here is one proof of concept demonstration using very simple optics, a direct, directly modulated laser, 10G, and a directed, uh, uh, directly uh, detected uh, APD receiver. In, in this case, uh, you can quantize the radio over fiber constellation through uh, this approximation, which naturally give you this advanced modulation format called PCS, probabilistic constellation shaping, that allow you to approach the channel limit closer. Then the approximation errors, approximation errors will be transmitted as is, uh, but with some magnification, so that in the end you can recover uh, the wireless signal with a high fidelity. Yeah. Uh, so with the use of only six gigahertz of bandwidth, uh, we were able to transmit uh, over uh, uh, 160 gigabit per second of uh, CPRI equipment data rate. Yeah. And then with this high fidelity, you could even transmit the 1024 quam, very advanced modulation format. You know, when I started uh, my work in Bell Labs uh, with Professor Knox in the advanced photonics department, our mission initially was to improve the performance of on off key, you know, the binary modulation with two levels. Now we are in the regime of 1,000 constellation points. Uh, by the way, one like, uh, very interesting thing we did first, you know, uh, in Professor Max's group is to, for the first time, introduce a phase shift uh, modulation uh, to the optical domain. So that was, uh, I think, one of the pioneering works. And immediately following that, we had we introduced the digital coherent detection, which becomes the backbone of today's uh, non-hole transmission. Yeah. So then with this format, if we use coherent modulation and the dual polarization uh, with, with this, uh, 64 gigabar, we can achieve over two terabits per second of a CPRI equivalent bit rate. And, and this can enable us to support uh, 6G-like systems. Uh, and then more recently, uh, by collaborating with a uh, uh, university group, uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, uh, we demonstrated uh, this uh, uh, the use of coherent detection to uh, to provide one terabit per second of uh, CPRI equipment data rate uh, using this uh, digital analog radio over fiber. Uh, then more recently at the ECOC this year, uh, you know uh, the university group uh, extended the work uh, to and also together with the space division multiplexing to achieve. As, uh, over one, sorry, uh, 10 terabits per second of uh, CPRI equipment data rate. We are using just one wavelength. Uh, a moment ago, we were discussing, uh, Professor Knox mentioned, uh, sometimes you want to minimize the number of wavelengths you want, uh, thereby uh, saving the cost. And that's indeed a very, very true, especially for those uh, 5G and 6G deployment. Yeah, so you can use one laser, uh, which is a very cost effective effective and share that laser uh, with the multiple passes and the multiple modulators, we can deliver 10.5 terabits per second of data rate. Yeah, so this uh, was a very recent result. Yeah. Then now we move on to the, uh, the aggregation section. Uh, then in the aggregation, we have uh, uh, actually an optical access network to aggregate all the home users and business users to a central office uh, by using this uh, passive splitter, which is uh, uh, 
uh, energy efficient because you do not consume any energy uh, in the optical distributing network, and, and yet you connect all the endpoints and do all the processing uh, in the central unit. So uh, more recently, I was heavily involved with this uh, next generation passive optical network, uh, which has just been fully standardized by ITU. Uh, this is called uh, 50G PON. Uh, with a 50 GB per second downstream transmission in the O band to minimize the dispersion penalty. And then upstream, initially, we had the two wavelengths that are uh, choosable uh, so that you can have a coexistence with the G pound or 10 G pound. Uh, then, uh, you know, this actually has been primarily standardized uh, in 2021, but then people realize that. So in some cases, we want to have a coexistence with both GPON, which has been very popular in, in US and like the Verizon's file, and the 10GPON, which is very popular in Japan and China. Uh, we want to have a coexistence with both generations. So now in, in the ITU meeting last month in Geneva, uh, the group has decided to introduce a third women in the middle, uh, which can support the, the coexistence of the three generations of uh, passive optical networks. So as you can see, even for this very low cost optical access uh, domain, we are heavily rely, relying on women's division multiplexing to achieve uh, hyper throughput and also to support uh, the backward compatibility. Yeah. Okay, then, uh, let's see, with the access network, we could also support those five G antennas, especially in the future when we have the so-called densitification of five G small cells. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to uh, uh, pass all the signals, share the optical fiber uh, through the uh, TDMA uh, 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 with, with the central office to reduce the cost of the second wave of uh, small cell deployment. And there, uh, the industry decided to have this uh, coordination, you see the co uh, cooperative dynamic bandwidth allocation uh, to achieve a low latency operation. So basically the wireless uh, dispute, uh, distribution unit will be able to communicate with our optical access network in such a way that the traffic will flow through without being stopped in the middle for a buffering. So basically we need to net the end users to know when to send the data so that when the data comes, there is, a, there is just about time to have a, a container, the time domain container in our optical access network to provide the, uh, the, the transport. Yeah. Uh, so, and this kind of coordination between wireless network and the optical network is very uh, important and, uh, and is making a lot of uh, uh, basically good contributions uh, to today's network. And this is being standardized by both ITU uh, and also ORA, which as you know, is a very important uh, organization, um, standardization organization uh, in the US to try to provide uh, interoperable uh, uh, implementations of those advanced features. Then uh, going forward, once we have the, um, uh, you know, uh, dispute units collecting all the data from wireless antennas. So we need to go to the central unit for um, further processing. Uh, then the typical way is to have an electronic aggregation unit, uh, which you need to consume power to terminate terminate all the endpoints through these point-to-point -point interactions, uh, you know, uh, links, and then. Uh, aggregate the traffic into a higher speed uh, transceiver uh, to communicate with the central unit. Uh, this is a typical way of doing things. But now there's a, a very interesting new design to, uh, to use this uh, coherent point to multipoint architecture to avoid the use of active uh, components in the field. By doing so, you can dramatically reduce the power consumption, the cost, and uh, you do not need a air conditioning, the central office or uh, equipment room in the field. So you can grab all the traffic 
from the G2 units and process that in the central office. And then through this coherent point to multipoint, you can share uh, this uh, optical channel with multiple digital sample carriers. You know, this is just one women's channel, but digitally you can form multiple uh, subbands and, and the different subsets of subbands can be addressed to uh, you know, a given distributed unit and you can dynam dynamically change them. Uh, and then the number of transceivers will be reduced by a factor of two. Yeah, so we had a, a proof of concept uh, about uh, trying to happen years ago, but now Infinera, a leading company in the US, uh, is uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, good works to advance uh, you know, this kind of designs. So now then we go to data center optics. Uh, so data centers, as you know, <laughs> are very important. Uh, our, we have a lot of data in the data center. They are doing the processing. It's like a Walmart in you know, a data center, you can think. And instead of those uh, food or uh, things to buy, uh, there, there are servers uh, to do all the computing and storage. Uh, this is a typical hyperscale data center uh, uh, in Google's public website. In such a place, uh, they may have uh, sometimes over 1 million servers running at the same time. So there are a lot of data centers deployed uh, global, globally. And we need, uh, we need uh, uh, fiber connections uh, to support uh, the data center interconnections. Because uh, if you look at uh, a shelf, they have a, a lot of uh, servers, um, uh, servers, maybe uh, 10 or 20. And then they have the top of rack um, switch, which will be talking to tier one switch, and then later tier two switch, and then later goes to uh, this gateway to talk to uh, this metro network, national network, and so on. So at, for different uh, uh, connection types, they have a different length requirement. Short reach, maybe 100 meters or less. Uh, data center reach up to 500 meters. Far reach, two kilometers. Uh, long reach, uh, 10 kilometers. Or ZR is a sample 80 kilometer reach. So di for different reach uh, requirements, we, we tailor the transceivers because there are a lot of transceivers needed. So we really need to reduce the cost of transceivers. So depending on the reach, we are tailoring the technology to make those transceivers most cost effective. Yeah. So um, currently in data centers, we are using 400 gig per second pluggable transceivers based on either IMDD, intensity detection, um, uh, so intensity modulation and direct detection using four lasers, uh, uh, EMA, electron absorption model, uh, modulation laser, and the photo detector. Yeah, four of them. Uh, or we can use uh, uh, coherent detection for interdata center, like 80 kilometer transmission distance. Uh, we still need the four quadratures standing for two positions and the two quadratures, basically the real and the imaginary part of the electronic wave uh, per polarization. Yeah. So as you can see, there are a lot of similarities. Basically, we need four high-speed digital to analog converters, four analog to digital converters, and a single processor, four drivers, four uh, types of detectors. Yeah. Uh, for MDD, we need four wavelengths. For direct detection, just one laser, but we need the more sophisticated modulator and uh, uh, coherent hybrid. Um, for the uh, direct detection based uh, modules, as you can see here, it's quite remarkable. Uh, with a QSFPDD double density format, still very small here you know, compared to a US dollar, a uh, US quarter. We can generate 400 gb per second of a data read and receive them. Yeah. So when I started to work in Bear Labs, uh, in Dr. Knox's uh, group, uh, we have a whole WDM system, you know, wave star uh, like 400. <laughs> that means we use 40 channels, each running at 10 gb per second to give you 400G. That's a whole system. <laughs> now just one pluggable can give you 400 gb per second. Uh, this is uh, thanks to the advance in high-speed modulation detection and the signal processing. So basically, 
a single processors are also helping the optical communication to achieve uh, the remarkable progress uh, over the last many years. So now going forward, uh, data center switch uh, is uh, still ramping up the capacity. Uh, the next stop would be uh, 800 gb per second transceiver speed. Uh, for a typical switch, you have 32 port. So that corresponds to 25.6 terabits per second. So basically now our industry is working heavily on 800 gb per second pluggables and in the near future, um, 1.6 T. Uh, but we haven't decided on the format and the power consumption uh, because to to realize these four wavelengths, each is running at a 200 gb per second with high power, relatively high power than before. We run into this classic problem of form mixing. <laughs> so we have to, uh, so basically for professors and students here in the University of Rochester, what do you do every day, you know, in terms of nonlinear optics, in terms of fundamental optics, play a huge role in commercial deployment of advanced systems. So our community, uh, actually, we read a lot. Professor Agor was uh, nonlinear fiber optics, uh, this classic uh, paper, uh, book, and also some other classic papers uh, uh, to 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 learn about the form mixing process and try to find ways to mitigate that. So uh, one uh, good, uh, basically, paper we found is by economy uh, chemistry, where we uh, when they were study studying this parametric amplifier, they try to maximize the four mixing effect. They found the best ways to have all the four wavelength channels to, to be co-polarized. Uh, this is very intuitive. You can right away appreciate that. And then if you have, a, but in order to have a producing diversity, they may have to rely on orthogonal pump, but then the efficiency goes lower. Then in their study, they found that if you have a, the first channel being horizontally, horizontally polarized, the second two channels being vertically polarized, then you will not be able to have any four mixing component. So that was a drawback uh, if you, you want to have a parametric amplifier. But for us, this is what we are looking for. So immediately I took a uh, uh, first study to this and I proposed it to our uh, you know, uh, industry in the IEEE meeting in the July this year to use this so-called XYY polarization. By doing so, this worst case um, non-degenerated four mixing will be gone because the four channels, you know, X, Y, Y, X, will not have any four mixing interaction. Yeah, uh, the reason for that, is, the physics picture for that is simple. It's basically, uh, even if they have interaction, uh, the, the face matching condition will be quickly deployed. Uh, destroyed by the brine fringes uh, of the fiber. Yeah, so every 10 kilometers, the phase will be randomized. So the four missing component will never grow exponentially. And then uh, you may wonder, in the two center channels are co polarized They will generate the so-called uh, degenerated uh, four mixing. But fortunately, the degenerated four mixing component, component will be orthogonal to the edge channels. So they, their interference will, won't be coherent interference. So the penalty will be uh, very small. So by doing so, uh, we showed the industry, if you do not manage the polarization, you can have a huge error flow you know, as a function of received power. Uh, with X, Y, X, Y, which already give you bigger reduction, uh, this X, Y, Y, X give you further reduction. Yeah, uh, this penalty here is due to dispersion. And this is even in the case of a PMD, uh, PMD can randomize some of the polarization uh, along the process. If we do not have a PMD, the blue curves, uh, sorry, the green curves will show zero penalty from for mixing. And this has been also experimentally verified by the IEEE uh, study group uh, by experts from Japan. So I think most likely this kind of uh, for mixing mitigation technique will be utilized to enable 800 gb per second and even 1.6 terabit data center optics. Yeah. Now we'll move on to uh, backbone transmission. So um, uh, I was fortunate to work in Bell Labs at that time and we, 
uh, coined the term super channel uh, to represent a special kind of WDM where you transmit multiple wavelength channels together uh, with high spectral efficiency through the network. So even about 10 years ago, we proposed this terabit per second super channel uh, concept. And this can give you multiple benefits such as uh, uh, higher, uh, you know, uh, zero, uh, sorry, per channel data rate, higher spectral efficiency, and better leverage of uh, large scale photonic integration, and the uh, feasibility to perform joint processing uh, to mitigate the transmission impairments, and also reduce the number of wavelength channels that I need to manage through the cross connect. In terms of optical cross connect, I know you know so Raj uh, has a lot of uh, expertise in free space optics. Those are very important to. Uh, as well, you know, to to uh, help people to realize women's routing, transparent women's routing in in intermediate nodes, so that we do not have to uh, do digital signal processing, uh, you know, uh, whenever possible, so that we can reduce the energy consumption. Uh, there, we want to reduce the number of channels as much as possible, uh, so that uh, you can. Uh, sustain the capacity goods, which is uh, exponential with uh, the linear expansion of uh, uh, port numbers. Yeah. Uh, and this, I actually uh, borrowed this slide from Dr. Brandon Collins, who was also a member of the team under Professor Knox, is now the CTO of uh, Normanton. Yeah, very, uh, he, he made a lot of good contributions. So, so with uh, uh, the use of super channel and uh, this advanced um, optical cross connect, uh, we can realize uh, petabits per second, you know, 1,000 terabits per second, 10 to the 18 bits per second optical cross connect capacity. Yeah. So a lot of good things uh, uh, going on in the backbone network. So if you want to have a quick summary about the transport part, uh, about 10 years ago, when coherent uh, receiver uh, was introduced, people were able to transmit eight terabits per second per fiber. Yeah. Meaning if you use ITU grid, 100, uh, 50 gigahertz of spacing, you have 80 channels. Each channel uh, is uh, 100, gig, 100 gigabits per second, so you get eight terabits per second. Three years later, uh, the community advanced to 200 G per wavelength with the higher speed modulation. Yeah. So that give us double the capacity, 16 terabit. Three years later, 400 gigabit per second became available, 32 terabit. And this year, commercially, there are 800 gigabit per second transceivers available, uh, giving you a total capacity per fiber of over 64 terabits per second. There, we also try to broaden the amplification bandwidth of EDFA and also leverage really high speed optical electronic devices. You know, in this case, the modulation bandwidth will be 106 gigabyte. Yeah, one, sorry, 130 gigabyte. In ECOC this year, as a post stamp paper, you know, Bell Labs together with the Keysight uh, reported the first 260 gigabyte single carry modulation. So there are still some headroom to go with that advanced, uh, you know, uh, optical electronics. To, to continue this route. Because if you can increase the modulation bandwidth, you can use the same, just the same op, uh, optics with one laser, one modulator, one detector uh, system to carry double the capacity. That means cost per bit and the energy consumption per bit will likely be reduced. Yeah. Uh, but still, as you can see, over the last 10 years, uh, every three years, you increase the capacity by a factor of two or three dB. So that means about one dB increase per fiber capacity. Uh, on the other hand, we know the network traffic is increasing at a speed of uh, about 1.5 dB per year, or two times a uh, two or uh, double per two years. This is reasonable because the Moore's law tells something similar. You know, that you can have twice the cap capability for every two years. Once you can have your processor to process that, uh, that much amount of data, the, the communication 
<laughs> capacity requirement or, uh, will also be scaling similarly. But then there is a disparity, meaning uh, even with so much advance in op optical electronics in digital transmission, our per wavelength channel data rate uh, is only increasing by 1 dB per year, but the capacity need is 1.5 dB per year. So that means we need to do uh, additional things. The first thing that people usually do is to deploy more fibers. Yeah, we, we need roughly half a dB more fiber or 12%. And in fact, if we look at some study over the last uh, 20 years, the, the fiber deployment is globally is going up uh, in this kind of speed. And I think Corning, you know, uh, the company nearby is also making good contribution to our society by providing good quality fibers. Yeah. And there are a huge number of fiber deployed. Uh, 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 instead of talking about the big, bigger number, uh, one number that we can easily uh, remember is that if you calculate roughly on our earth, every person may own, may own about 100 meters worth of fiber. Hundred meters of fiber. Yeah. Okay, so now, uh, in, uh, so that means uh, the Morse law is going up, and we need to continue to advance our optical uh, systems to sustain the capacity growth by either, either deploying more fiber, and also at the same time reduce the cost per fiber and cost of a per fiber system. Uh, um, then. But the Morrison law, the second law also tells the cost will go up very quickly. So it would be good to have a global cooperation and a collaboration so that we can drive innovation together and also share the investment cost so that uh, uh, our end user, every regular person will benefit uh, from the scientific uh, advance without paying additional, uh, uh, basically paying too much additionally. So then the first up would be to have uh, uh, high, higher speed and even better photonic integration by integrating, um, you know, electronic circuits and optical circuits together. Yeah, I think there are a lot of good things going on in universities. Uh, uh, yeah, here, you know, currently for data center optics, people are still talking about pluggable transceivers, but the beyond 1.6 terabits per second, terabits per second, uh, we may start to see co-packed optics to be uh, utilized. Then we are uh, also advancing the digital, digital, digital modulation to better uh, approach the channel limit. Yeah. Then optic amplifiers, you know, uh, Charles Carr, Sir Charles Carr uh, proposed the use of a low loss fiber for communication for that he won the Nobel Prize uh, in, in physics. Then uh, David Penn and others reported the first EDFA and we think the ne next Nobel Prize in optic communication could be the pioneers who work on amplifiers because that enabled each fiber to provide huge bandwidth, you know, four terahertz for C band, and so that we can support a lot of wireless channels. Uh, but then uh, over the last uh, 20 some years, uh, the EDFA, the conventional band is always four terahertz. But more recently, through advances uh, in material science and chemistry, we were able to broaden the conventional C band to go the, to the so called super C band with six terahertz of bandwidth, and then further broaden the L band to six terahertz. Now we can, can have 12 terahertz of uh, spectrum available to us per fiber. Yeah. And uh, there was a recent paper with China Telecom uh, experts. Then if we look at the, the channel limit and then consider the nonlinear channel limit, uh, we can derive some simple formulas to, uh, to talk about the figure of merit of a fiber. Um, due to the time limitation, I will not go through the details, but I know uh, for our professor and university uh, students in uh, University of Rochester, you might be, uh, must be very intrigued with all the formulas and, and the concepts. So, so I think I have to show some of the formulas here. So basically all the engineer, engineering works done in optical communication field, we rely heavily on a very rigorous model of the system, you know, nonlinear model, linear model, uh, and modulation digital uh, processing information theory. 
And in this case, we can derive a very simple analytical formula to provide the figure of merit. And then for coherent modulation, uh, assuming the Gaussian noise model, uh, we can see that if we can increase the uh, fiber core effective error to reduce the nonlinearity and reduce the, also reduce the loss of the fiber, the loss of fiber uh, from, you know, 0.2 dB per kilometer to 0.17 dB per kilometer. And, and then we can increase the figure merit by 3 dB. And in fact, ITU uh, just standardized this GTA 654E fiber, uh, which has uh, this kind of uh, performance uh, to allow 3 dB increase in figure merit corresponding to twice the reach uh, uh, for the same modulation format. Uh, or you can increase the specificity by uh, two bits per polarization division multiplexing symbol. Yeah. And then in this case, the dispersion, the larger dispersion help you. <laughs> uh, this is a quite a counterintuitive because now with uh, the digital signal processor as a receiver, the linear impairment such as the chromatic dispersion can be fully compensated without any worry. So, but then with dispersion, you can mitigate the nonlinearity further by that, this kind of averaging effect. So this uh, turned out to be very useful. Then, so uh, the key thing is to actually reduce the loss of fiber <laughs> if we could. Uh, and there are a lot of good advances in this field uh, from uh, University of uh, Southampton in UK at the LC post stamp paper last year, uh, they showed uh, 0.17 dB per kilometer hollow core fiber with this uh, cavity design, it's a nest, double nested anti-resistance and node-nest fiber. Node-nest means no solid material in the core. Yeah, they, they realize the broadband uh, communication. Then after the talk, I was there <laughs> at OFC, they showed um, the even better results in the, from the lab, fresh from the lab of a, less than 0.14 dB per kilometer. And this is a new record. This actually beat the record of a solid core, a solid core fiber. So when people started started talking about hollow core fiber, we never expect the loss to go down so quickly. So thanks to the advance in this kind of a, a fiber engineering. Yeah. On the other hand, this fiber is very expensive, <laughs> maybe more than 100 times more expensive than a solid core fiber. So it may be used initially for load low latency applications in data centers for supercomputing and some other uh, important uh, tasks. Yeah. So then going forward, uh, you know, in year 2030, we expect to enter the, uh, the decade of 60 and F60. And now we are in the transition period called F5G advanced. And in ETSI, uh, this um, uh, study group F5G uh, sometimes we call industry specification group, you know, ISG, you know, I5G. We just published a white paper uh, on I5G Advance and Beyond, which can be free, freely download, downloaded uh, from here. So in addition to the three dimensions that we need to further advance to be you know, faster, uh, um, and more reliable and smarter and wider in deployment uh, in terms of fiber reach, we also need to be greener to to really reduce the energy consumption and to be quicker uh, for low latency industrial applications um, and to be more aware of the, the, the environment. And very quickly, I will just go through a couple of slides to show that, you know, indeed there are a lot of uh, good use cases of how we can leverage the fiber network to deliver values to end customers. Yeah. So, uh, fiber is no is no longer considered as, as a hidden pipe under the ground. We want the fiber to reach in the customers, um, uh, like 5G, so that every regular person will appreciate the value delivered by optics and photonics. And in this year, uh, in June, uh, a new release uh, of 40, 18 use cases has, has been publicized. Uh, for example, zero broadband, we can bridge the uh, digital divide. And remember, when I first joined the Bad Labs in the year 2000, uh, you know, Professor Knox needed some effort on, on the effort 
from balance in terms of how to reduce, you know, how to bridge the digital uh, digital uh, uh, divide. Yeah. So uh, if we can deploy fiber wider, we can really help uh, those rural areas. People can work there with a uh, high speed connectivity, uh, as in big cities. Yeah. Uh, and as well as uh, edge and cloud based uh, computing to support industry 4.0 like services. And so on, so forth. Then, just a couple of examples. Uh, in F5G Advanced, we can leverage Wi Fi 7 and the 50G PON in all indoor environments to provide uh, high speed connectivity without any interference because we can have a mini optical network inside each office, building, or home to have a coordinated Wi Fi. Uh, we can turn Wi-Fi into telecommunication quality wireless uh, solution, like 5G. Uh, and Wi-Fi is more cost-effective and energy efficient uh, with the fiber connections. So that in the future, even in, uh, in all indoor environments, you know, basically we can leverage fiber with Wi-Fi 7, Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 7. Yeah. So we can complement. Uh, the good things done by 5G for outdoor mobility environment. Yeah. And then the, the European standardization body is uh, not working alone. It's working with IEEE, uh, Broadband uh, Forum and ITU and, uh, and other uh, organizations such as the CCSA, the China Communication Standardization Association to brainstorm about FTDR uh, last year. Uh, and then in one year, we are already sh sharing good uh, stories of uh, deployment <laughs> of FTDR in many places to enable this kind of uh, um, uh, unprecedented uh, connectivity in, in, in indoor environments. Yeah. Then, and further, going further, you know, uh, F5G Advance will broaden the scope, not only for access, aggregation, you know, uh, this uh, wide area network, uh, metro access network, but also have backbone, uh, uh, basically all optical uh, network, uh, or optically switched network, and uh, routing network, and so that we can provide this global coverage. And this uh, uh, is uh, introduced by China Telecom and uh, uh, reported in this white paper. Then China Mobile also contributed uh, uh, some ideas in terms of the joint optimization of uh, cloud computing and networking uh, to have this kind of synergy. Yeah. So a lot of good things are happening to, to leverage the fiber network to enable clouds to be better deployment, uh, deployed to better support or the end users. Then there is a the so-called harmonized communication and sensing. Uh, this is a very interesting and hot topic. Uh, there were a lot of good papers, you know, published in Science uh, and Nature, uh, you know, by um, experts from Verizon and Google, and also Hong Kong um, Polytechnic University, uh, in terms of using the deployed fiber network to serve as the sensing network for earthquake, tsunami, and so on. This can really benefit the network. And also with the uh, disputed sensing, you can locate where something happens. And that can also help you to, uh, to protect the environment and to monitor many things that you, you would like to, to have. Then at the ECOC uh, this year, uh, you know, um, just one month ago, uh, we had uh, a workshop and one of the organizers with uh, Philip uh, from Orange uh, to talk about F5G and the, the evolution towards F6G. So we had uh, over 10 experts from the industry and the academia to brainstorm uh, what's next. So we talk about real-time, uh, actually this is a real-time proof of concept demonstration of fiber to the room to show what has been uh, proposed in the first release of F5G uh, uh, can really be deployed. And then we talk about this, uh, uh, for example, in this uh, 
a computing force network and the method adverse. Uh, uh, then we brainstorm with, uh, you know, especially led by experts from Bell Labs, Nokia, to talk about uh, opportunities and the evolution beyond F5G, even F6G in terms of the vision and the key enabling technologies. Yeah. So a lot of good things are going on. Uh, and also this current point to multi-point by the CTO of Infinera, uh, uh, Dr. David Woods. So then, uh, as you can see, uh, in, in the indus industrial environment, there are a lot of uh, advances going on that need uh, support from academia in, term, in terms of fundamental breakthroughs. So the very exciting thing that um, Optica, you know, the former Optical Society of America, established a, a foundation challenge program. It's like a grand challenge uh, to encourage our community to use photonics, find a solution and change the world for, for the better. And, and um, while I was honored to be one of the selection committee members, and I think Professor uh, uh, Janik uh, 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 Ro Ronan uh, is uh, from University of Rochester, is also one of the selection committee members. So together, we, we came up with three categories to target, uh, to aim for environment, health, and information. For information, we understand that modern humanity and the, the global economy, economy rely on heavily you know, optical infrastructure, and we need a game-changing uh, breakthroughs to keep up. And also, I'm happy to report that, um, you know, just last month, uh, Optica, you know, through the selection committee, uh, we have uh, received uh, over nearly 100 global applications. And then we selected the, the top 10, as promised, to give uh, out one million dollars to support the 10 projects. And the winning proposals are listed here, and you can go to this website to find more details. If you clip. Uh, each person you will see their executive summary, a one-page summary to highlight what they are, uh, they are aiming to achieve. So in the environment category, uh, we have a, a very good can, uh, you know, winning proposal from Kenya uh, in Africa uh, to try to use optics for sensing to help uh, detecting of water contaminations, uh, contaminants, and also we, there are ways to use optics to monitor water, you know, gas, and also to 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 you know harness uh, energy. Yeah. Then for health, uh, we can use flat optics <laughs> to provide better imaging uh, and uh, and better medical imaging like OCT uh, as well as uh, uh, holography. Uh, for information, we have three winners, uh, one from Hong Kong, to, to use uh, basically neuromorph uh, um, neuromorphic uh, processor to do uh, better signal processing in the optical domain, as well as uh, uh, massive space DVD multiplexing based uh, uh, optical connections, and then high-speed modulation. Uh, just a real quick highlight, this is one and um, basically proposal, if you click that page, you can see uh, they uh, try to use this kind of a optical processor to enable uh, better overall processing in the network. As well as this handhold uh, portable uh, OCT leveraging uh, high speed cynical photonics. So in summary, uh, we are really in this exciting F5G era and we are uh, migrating towards F6G. And then we are uh, uh, facing the fundamental challenges imposed by the channel limit uh, as well as the Morris law. So multifaceted innovations are needed from photonic integration to architectural uh, innovations to uh, a lot of fundamental breakthroughs. Then global cooperation and collaboration are essential to the realization of the full value of uh, optical communication. As well as new optical applications such as environmental sensing and monitoring and medical imaging for the common benefit of our society. 
And we're thankful that we have a lot of global standardization bodies to work together to, to encourage and allow people from many countries to work together so that we can achieve uh, this uh, vision for our society. Uh, with that, I will stop here and thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, Sean. That's a really incredible uh, visionary talk you have here. Um, and uh, I think you probably also hit the limit, probably more acronyms than any talk we've had recently. So I think that was fantastic. Um, we can open up this uh, talk to uh, any questions. So any questions in the audience, um, you can either raise your hand or you can put it in the chat um, or yeah, just start talking. Uh, then maybe I was uh, stop sharing so that I can see the questions. Uh, yeah, in the meantime, sure. I have a, just one quick backup slide for people who would like to know more about uh, new advances in optical communication. There are classical books, including Professor yeah. Algora's book. Uh, then also during the pandemic, uh, I used my free time during the evening hours uh, to write a book, uh, which provides some update uh, on the, uh, you know, uh, the state of the art. And if you're interested, you can find the paper for free from uh, elsewhere, yeah. Excellent, looks great. Okay, yeah, so you can stop your share and we can go ahead and um, open the talk okay. to any kind of questions. Yep. Okay, questions for the speaker. So Wayne, I, I have a question. This is Tom Brown. Thank you yeah. so much for the talk. Um, mm -hmm. Really appreciate you uh, you speaking. When when people talk about expanding the fiber window um, to the you know both the T and the L band and expanded, well, I I guess I missed what people are looking at for amplifier technology for the expanded window. Is this still erbium or are there other technologies? Oh yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, yes, so even for the so-called super C band, where we broaden the conventional band, we need to have a different doping, additional chemical uh, dopants. And also we need to uh, find the energy levels uh, and target those energy levels with different pump wavelengths. So a lot of uh, advance in that field, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question about uh multi-mode and multi-core fibers. I mean, what is the status of that uh, SDM technology? Where, where are we these days? Uh, mm, could yeah, you comment sure. on that? Yeah, Professor Agua, a very good question. Um, so actually I did one of the first papers on multi-core uh, publishing our place press, but then uh, as you quickly realize, uh, we are not saving much by using multi-core fiber, multi-mode fiber, because most of the cost will be on transceivers. We're not saving transceivers. With the multi-mode, you have to do mode division, demultiplexing, that actually make the receiver even more. So then people realize maybe multi-core. But multi-core fibers, uh, you may only save in fiber. You know, transceivers, you do not save. You, you actually need a, a fine in fine out of devices, which introduce the loss, yeah. So let's assume you get those fine in fine out of, device for free, then it's just the fiber saving. But then if you look at the seven core fiber, the cost is way more than seven times a single mode fiber. <laughs> if oh, you yeah, ask- I see. Oh, wow, okay. okay. Yeah, it's, it's over 10 times. So, you are, so basically cost you are not saving. So in the end of the community realized, okay, maybe the only benefit is the density. Uh, so single fiber, I can put the seven cores, so the density is higher, but the, we are nowhere near the limit of trying to push it for higher density. Uh, and because as you know, just for uh, our uh, information, a, a typically deployed fiber uh, on the ground, a cable, it can have over 100 single mode fibers inside, sometimes three or 400 cable fibers. So people are not using up all the fibers anyway. And also it's already been very densely packed. Okay, and then even if you want to Let's say 10 years later, even if you want to have uh, that uh, higher density provided by uh, multi-core, you could still try to use a traditional way to make the single mode fiber to be smaller because the cladding you can, you can reduce. Uh, so there are a lot of competition going on in that direction. 
So that means the multi-core fiber uh, is not uh, providing the needed the promise. And if you look at the OFC conference, the papers, the number of papers on space debating multiplexing is much reduced. Uh, on the other hand, there's, yeah, there are some niche applications of space debating multiplexing, but undersea communication where the electronic power is limited, and then you may leverage space debating multiplexing to, to optimize the energy consumption. Then for some, some applications, data center applications, for example, maybe you could use multi-core uh, so that other core that the passes will have a similar delay. So when you have when you need those kind of special, uh, basically, uh, uh, how to say, uh, aspects, then you may uh, uh, use some of the advances in space debating multiplexing. So with all that being said, I would say it's a good journey, good study process. A lot of students have been trained, uh, and also there are some valuable outcome, but not the. Uh, not uh, the, uh, the replacement of the current network. Yeah. Thank you. It, we, yeah, we're still open uh, for questions from the audience. Kai, I don't know if you have any questions in the audience, you can let me know, or you can put them in the chat. Um, you know, while we're waiting for that, I have a question here about, um, uh, that is a astonishing advance in the hollow core fibers uh, that, that they got right down to, you know, pretty much matching the very best of the best. Um, and so, I really wonder a couple of things. One is that really, really fabrication. The uniformity of the fabrication. Um, do you know what really was the big advance that they that they did to get there? Mm, yeah, yeah. So yeah, indeed, it was a remarkable advance. Uh, several, uh, several basically key things. Uh, one thing, as you mentioned, the uniformity, the process need to be good. But at the beginning, I think the fundamental breakthrough was to use this nested anti-resonance cavity design so that you can really achieve this kind of photonic crystal like you know, photonic gap uh, fiber, right? So that you will have the will, uh, this kind of uh, uh, confinement uh, over a broadband uh, bandwidth uh, in order to be relevant. Uh, uh, even with that being said, I think. Um, the, the, uh, now people can only produce, uh, you know, sh uh, sh uh, limited uh, length of a fiber. So that means we still need a progress to make make it to be uh, to be commercially viable. Uh, and also the cost is uh, much much higher because the preform will be <laughs> so much more sophisticated. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it's it's probably um, would have like a niche niche applications of very very specific applications that need it. Um, but that's that's a problem then because it won't drive the volume for them to to drive the cost down. So it's, it may be quite a while before that's commercially used, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. President, I've already mentioned uh, niche application, uh, but then volume. Maybe for some niche application, people are willing to pay much more. Yes, those are the people. Yeah. The niche application yeah. is one where there's a huge amount of money, right? So right, right, right. Because in data centers, they are doing a lot of computing, right? And if they have to have those low latency connectivity uh, by using this, uh, you know, air <laughs> in the core, right? They can reduce the latency by uh, one third. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how much they're willing to pay, you know, a million dollars a kilometer or something. I don't know, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, any other questions from the audience here? Uh, I think Darius had a question, I thought. Darius. Yeah, yeah, I have a question. So, you know, you're working with all these so I'm a I'm an IP guy. So you're working with all these different standards groups um, in the development of you know IP. Uh, which group do, do you think that this should be spun off as like a separate standards group to think about this part of the evolution of 5G moving on to the next generation standards or how, where does this fit within the 3GPP organization? I mean, is this a new group that's emerging and are you participating in those standards or what, mm -hmm. who, who's defining those? Go yeah, forward. you mean IP, huh? Yeah, so first of all, uh, uh, you said very well, for mobile network, they leverage ITU and the 3GPP to define, you know, the generations of standards. Then for opt communication or face network that assume is uh, very broad you know we have a component level spec we have a subsystem system yeah and the control and management 
then uh, that's why we had uh, so many standardization bodies, you know, IEEE, uh, EITO, OIF, uh, you know, ETSI, uh, and so on. Uh, but then for the uh, IP part, it's more on the control layer. That layer, uh, ETSI has this AN, you know, autonomous network uh, group to try to uh, basically contribute to that part uh, of a standardization. Then in the US, there is IETF. Uh, you know, I'm with the optical domain, so I'm not so much into the IP part, but in I5G, in order to have this end-to-end -end network slicing capability, we need the control and the management. And uh, so ETSI is doing some of the work, but uh, uh, is also working closely with the IETF and, uh, and other standardization bodies to try to fill the gap. It's a good well, yeah, well, I mean, the reason why I asked this question is because, you know, when Nortel and AT&T formed 2G and then Qualcomm came in, um, you know, later in 3G, you know, you had big companies that were defining these areas and then rolling out the infrastructure. I'm just curious because, you know, in the optics, who's going to be the big systems player? I mean, is that going to be Cisco? Is that going to be a Juniper? Like, who who's going to be defining how these things get rolled out. I mean, is it Verizon? Like which which one of these large companies is, is gonna be the implementer of what you're thinking about and what you've spelled out here? Because it sounds like yeah. a lot of different groups that need to be coordinated mm -hmm. for different- yeah. So, so yeah, again, if you uh, uh, recall that picture, I tried to put uh, in a PowerPoint file, optical domain has a, a lot of segments you know, from aggregation, uh, access, uh, metro, backbone, data center. And for each segment, uh, there is a well-established standardization body. So in each uh, basic segment, there are key players. You know, for, for example, for optical access, uh, for 50G pump, Verizon, AT&T, uh, big players, uh, right. si similar ETT, you know, Orange uh, from France, then, then Nokia, uh, Huawei are uh, also key players from the system vendor point of view. Then in data center optics in IEEE, there will be like a Google, Facebook, they are the key players <laughs> from the end user perspective. And then suppliers will be multiple companies. Yeah, because uh, the optical communication field is much more diverse as compared to, you know, mobile network. That's why so far we have uh, so many standardizing bodies. Yeah, so you, you basically answer my question. There's a lot and it's fragmented and there's going to yeah, have some coordination between all these these groups for this end-to-end -end solution to be developed and it's not clear yet how the future yeah. uh, interface. So right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's why that's why we have this so-called uh, I5G group. The function yeah. of I5G is try to coordinate, you know, like an environment to look for, first of all, I thought you would like to have a vision, then use cases, find what we, then find the gaps, you know, uh, targeting some use cases. Do we have all the needed standards? If not, who will be the one doing that with the collaboration with others? Yeah, so basically, I thought is trying to serve that purpose. Yeah. You are exactly right. We lack that kind of uh, coordination, and uh, the ETSI I5G is trying to fill that gap. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, yeah, I think we're we're going to wrap it up here, Shang. But one thing I want to ask you is, going back 22 years ago, uh, when you were looking for a job and you 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 came into the telecom field, right? It was a perfect time. Right? It was very exciting. Um, what's your advice to the students uh, getting ready to graduate now? Uh, do you think it's time for them to go back into telecom again? Is it is it all exciting? Is all the bad stuff shaken out now after 22 years? And is the field of telecom really exciting for the students to go into? What do you think now? If we were doing this again 22 years later, right? Ah, oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I haven't thought about this question, but I would say um, if, uh, for students here uh, to be proactive, uh, as for the next trying to commit as for the small story I had. So when you find something you are really passionate about, then when you go to conference like Clio, OFC or the files, once you hear a very good speaker from a company or from a university, you don't be shy, talk to them. You know, those top experts, they love to talk to young people. Yeah, talk to them uh, and get their perspective, uh, if not the job. Uh, so, so 
you basically talk to more people, then you can find the right place, you know, uh, that can where you can pursue your passion. In terms of optic communication, I would say there are a lot of interesting going on. But what I mean is, uh, as mentioned by the uh, Optica uh, Foundation Challenge, there are a lot of ways to use photonics and optics to change our world for the better. So as long as you, you have a good skill set in optics, uh, you, you can definitely find a job either in communication, in medical imaging, in you know, in environmental engineering, or or, uh, or lab. Uh, then then with time going on, all the skill set with also with the new skill set you have will be able to find a good use. Yeah, to to our company. Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I think we can all give a nice for that mm -hmm. talk. Thank you, Sean. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll catch up with you next time you're here. Yeah. Thank okay, you all. Hey, very good. Thank you for coming in. It was wonderful to have you here. Yeah. Bye, Thank everybody. you. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye.